Good morning and um, welcome. We're going to wait a couple of minutes before we get started here. I see a number of people are coming in under the participant uh, code here. So let's uh, wait just a couple more minutes for people to join us before we begin. I think it's 10.02, I think we should go ahead and get started. I, uh, people are continuing to join the uh, video, so we'll, but we'll get started right now since we have a lot to cover this morning. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, vi virtual event that we're having uh, concerning confronting rural America's healthcare crisis. Uh, today, we're releasing at the Bipartisan Center the Rural Healthcare Task Force's recommendations for this. I'm Bill Hoagland, I'm a senior vice president with the center and have the distinct pleasure of working with and overseeing our uh, healthcare project here. We have, as I say, a very full agenda this morning. So let me get a few logistics out of the way quickly. Um, for We are all adjusting to this new way of conducting meetings and events. So we hope everything works out as we go through and thank the uh, production company for helping us put this on. Um, for those of you who have joined via this Zoom uh, platform, uh, you will receive a message shortly from one of our staff, specifically Morgan Bailey, in the chat box function with a link to the report. Uh, for the viewers, and maybe C-SPAN viewers and others who wish to get a copy of the report, you can also go to our website, uh, bipartisanpolicy.org, and a link to the report will be on the BPC events page under the health section. And later this morning, you will have an opportunity to submit your questions uh, to our task force members via the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen here. So uh, to the purpose of this event, uh, personally coming from a rural area of Indiana with our family farm still operational, this is a personal uh, issue with me. Over 126 hospitals have closed uh, since 2010, and an estimated nearly 560 hospitals were at risk of closing even before COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Dr. Susan Turney, she's a chief executive of the Marshfield Clinic Health System in Wisconsin, a system that uh, we work with at BPC, recently was quoted as I quoted, the rural health care was in a crisis before this pandemic and that funding to stabilize systems today is critical so we can continue to survive. We are all hopeful that uh, an agreement can be reached in Congress, uh, even in the Senate, maybe later today, that will add additional funding to our hospital systems out there that are in so dire need of assistance and particularly those in rural areas. At the outset here, BPC would like to thank the Helmsley Charitable Trust for its generous support of the work that we've done on, with the Rural Task Force here. Uh, we launched this project uh, over a year ago and long before uh, COVID-19 was an issue. Uh, but we believe that many of the recommendations today can help stabilize rural hospitals during this current crisis and better support the rural healthcare system post-crisis. Our task force of very distinguished healthcare leaders was co-chaired by Senators Tom Daschle and Olympia Snow, who you will hear from very shortly here, along with two other co-chairs, former governors, Ronnie Musgrove of Mississippi and Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin. The BP staff and the task force members visited um, rural hospitals in New Hampshire, in Iowa, Maine, Tennessee, Vermont, and even Wisconsin. We also had the insights of an honorary bipartisan congressional uh, task force on rural health care, uh, including Senators Chuck Grassley of Iowa, Tina Smith of Minnesota, Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, Angus King of Maine, and Congressman Jody Arrington of Texas, and Congresswoman Tora Small 
of New Mexico. Senator Grassley has not been able to join us this morning, but he has given me a statement to read, and, and that will be followed by a video from a Congresswoman Small and one from uh, Senator Cassidy before I turn it over to Marilyn Serapini, the director of the BPC's Health Project, for a discussion with members of the task force. So Senator Grassley's statement, as a solutions oriented organization, the Bipartisan Policy Center has deep leadership bench from which to help shape the rural health care debate. I welcome and encourage the BPC advocacy efforts which bring a range of policy options to the table. As chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, I have been working over the past year to develop a targeted set of common sense Medicare payment policies that help isolated rural communities provide reasonable access uh, and needed medical care as close to home as possible. I'll continue leveraging my leadership positions to, chair, to, to champion innovative, cost-effective, and high-quality rural healthcare policy solutions. I will review the BPC policy options released today carefully. It's my hope that these recommendations will spur more candid dialogue among the unique challenges facing our rural health care delivery system. This is important as lawmakers in Washington develop meaningful solutions and work together to find a bipartisan path forward. Cross-party coalitions are the best way to turn targeted rural health care solutions into law. I ask BPC to work with me to help build that kind of bipartisan coalitions as I work on formulating policies that will get more lawmakers on board in Washington. The bottom line is that the rural health care matters. Many rural communities are struggling to keep health care services available to their residents. This is especially true with the pressures of the ongoing nationwide fight against COVID-19. The sacrifices and efforts to stop the spread of the coronavirus have shut down the U.S. economy and life as we know it. This virus has and will continue to invade small towns and big cities. One thing we can count on is that our rural hospitals and rural providers are standing guard on the front lines ready to care for the people living in their own communities. Even as the devastating effects of the public health emergency deal blow to the economy and exhaust healthcare professionals, we can see communities banding together to help neighbors in need in ways big and small. America's entrepreneurs, medical scholars, innovators, data scientists, and captains of industry are, are collaborating through our civic organizations, academic institutions, businesses, and all levels of government to stop the spread, save lives, and solve problems. We need to harness that same energy to make sure that rural providers are equipped to address the unique healthcare needs of their com communities now and in the future. Pitching in and pulling together, the resilience of the American spirit will guide us to better days ahead. Thank you. Senator Grassley's statement. At this time, we're going to have a video from uh, Congresswoman Torres Small from New Mexico. I apologize, I guess it's Grassley. Thank you for joining the Bipartisan Policy Center today for this virtual event, releasing the Rural Health Task Force Report and Policy Recommendations. Communities across the country are facing unprecedented times. We're having to fight to keep our families safe and our lives together. All of America is hurting right now, but many rural communities are hurting in silence. Since the start of this public health emergency, I have fought for emergency funding for our rural health care facilities, expanding telehealth in our rural areas, and protecting the rural health care workforce. Recently, I've also joined my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to demand federal accountability to our rural communities and called on the administration to establish a rural COVID-19 task force. This public health crisis only heightens the need for bipartisan collaboration to deliver solutions that listen to our rural communities and take swift action. 
As we continue to fight the spread of COVID-19, Congress must continue to put partisan politics aside and work across party lines and pass legislation to deliver for our rural communities. COVID-19 has also shown the importance of continuing this work even after our communities heal from this crisis. Existing challenges like access to good, reliable broadband and health care must be addressed to ensure we're serving families no matter where they live. I've introduced legislation to incentivize medical residents to practice in rural communities and expand telehealth services for new and expecting mothers in remote areas. The fight for our rural families will continue, and I thank the Bipartisan Policy Center for your focus on rural communities with the creation of the Rural Health Task Force. The task force recommendations are critical to creating policy that supports rural health care and delivers solutions. Thank you for joining the Bipartisan Policy today, and I look forward to working with many of you in the future. Thank you. Obviously, that was, at least on the video, that was uh, Senator Cassidy uh, appearing instead of uh, Congresswoman Torres. As I said at the outset, we're all learning this new technology, and uh, hopefully we can work out some of these bugs. But now could we try to have uh, Senator Cassidy's uh, video queued up? Hello everybody, Bill Cassidy here, who's a doctor, but also a United States Senator. In my medical practice, I used to work in a hospital for the uninsured. And that included many that had to come from far away from rural communities. And then I realized these are the folks that have transportation. There's a lot of folks out there in the rural communities who are reliant upon others, which is to say they may or may not have transportation. So I'm aware of these challenges. And I think our challenge is how do we improve access and improve care for those who are in rural communities. This has been so highlighted by the novel coronavirus epidemic. And, uh, and although right now the rural communities have been relatively, relatively unscathed, I saw an article in the New York Times a day or so ago in which we begin to see increasing numbers of cases in the rural communities. So again, if our challenge is how do we uh, preserve, increase, access and improve care in rural communities, the future is now. Now that said, those in the rural communities struggle with many of the things that you struggle with, whether or not you're in the rural community. The cost of healthcare is too high. Insurance um, uh, deductibles uh, on the exchange plans, for example, are extremely high. The cost of medications are very high. And if you look at the prevalence of diabetes in the rural areas, it tends to be higher which means that more of them are going to be diabetics. So the cost of insulin is going to be a particular problem. It's also difficult to recruit providers to rural areas, kind of a, a vicious cycle in that as the economic fortune of a community declines, there's less to appeal to a spouse, a trailing spouse, if you will, if he or she has another career, where do they work? If there's an economic decline, which means that your physician workforce tends to get older, their kids grow up, move away, and then again, you have more economic decline because you don't have a young doctor there to attract a family with the assurance of good health care. We need somehow to reverse that. Um, I'll also add that statistically, those in the rural areas are older, not just the workforce, not the physician workforce, but everybody, a little bit older and more chronic disease. So again, we've got a challenge. How do we preserve access to health care in the rural areas? How do we improve it? That kind of lays it out. What have we been attempting to do? Well, the novel coronavirus epidemic is going to give us a lot of tragedy. Clearly, it's disrupted our economy. But there might be some good things that come out of it. So, for example, we are expanding our use of telehealth. Isn't that wise? So now the provider can communicate with the person across town or across the state and deliver services. We had that capability before in the rural areas because of the need to implement this more wide, in a more widespread fashion because of novel coronavirus, we're going to scale. And I think having gone to scale, that would be very beneficial. Secondly, we're making more use of home health. Before a patient had to come see the doctor, the doctor would evaluate them, fill out a form, send them home, they get home health. With expanded use of telehealth, it may be the doctor won't physically see the patient, but they could monitor their blood pressure with a blood pressure cuff or their 
uh, oxygen level and pulse with a pulse oximeter. The patient's at home 100 miles away from the doctor. The doctor sees there's an issue, can, can um, send home health to that home and have the condition addressed and the patient never needs to come in. Recall I said when I worked in that public hospital for the uninsured, uh, if, the, if the patient in the rural area was dependent upon others for transportation, it may be they did not have transportation. We kind of eliminate that as an issue with expanded use of remote monitoring, telehealth, as well as uh, home health. I'll also point out that under this current law, we are allowing expanded use of what is telehealth. Uh, it doesn't have to be something with a video conference. It can be a smartphone in which somebody speaks to the doctor this way, and that is communicated uh, over the smartphone. That may or may not stay in place after the coronavirus, but I do think we're, we're becoming more innovative in how we use current technology. There's a special need as well. That's something my office is particularly interested in, which is maternal health. If you look at maternal health outcomes, they tend not to be as good for those women delivering children if they come from rural areas as they are in suburban or urban areas. And so we also have to address that as a special case. There's a lot of, ish, a lot of effort to do that and I'm sponsoring some of that in, in, uh, through federal legislation. Um, so we continue, if you will, by a variety of circumstances to attempt to, again, preserve access to health care in the rural area and to improve it. Now, what else do we do? I thank you for having this conference. One thing we do is draw the attention of thought leaders and policymakers uh, and those who influence policymakers through a conference such as this. So I thank you for your leadership. We also have to explore it. We have to understand in a way which, unless you've been there, you may not understand. We have to understand that someone who lives 50 miles away from a doctor who has a car which is 40 years old may not be able to get to the doctor. And I can tell you that fundamental lack of understanding of the circumstances of a poor person's life who lives in a rural area, as I think limited the imagination of what we attempted to do. We, also, we need to come up with novel financing plans. There's been a lot of attempts to, for example, through, um, uh, through the uh, Affordable Care Act and through accountable care organizations to reduce the cost per person. But if those folks are in the rural area, there should be gain sharing with the rural hospital. You need to preserve that rural hospital for, so the, the patient has a place to go if there's an emergency. She has some place to go to get her labs done. It also provides employment for the economy. And by the way, did I say that she doesn't have good access to an automobile? This brings the care closer to her. Now, I think the mission of the rural hospital will evolve, but there still needs to be gain sharing through our financial policies so that that rural hospital, as costs are decreased, benefits and allows them to keep their doors open. Um, I think there has to be novel ways of uh, delivering health care aside from that which we've discussed. My practice uh, involved public health. We vaccinated 36,000 children for hepatitis B, and we did it by bringing vaccinations to the uh, classroom. And at no cost to the parents or the teachers or the school system, we vaccinated uh, the, the children at school. We brought the health care to the student. We need to think of other ways to bring uh, health care, for example, a mobile mam mammography unit so that the person doesn't have to drive 50 miles in to get her mammogram. She can have it through a mobile unit. I could go on, but I think you have the concept. So again, I thank you. Our mutual goal is how do we improve access and improve to, to improve health care in the rural areas. It's important for the patients. It's important for the uh, economic economics of the rural area. I'll add one more thing. If there's one thing that coronavirus has taught us is that we're in it together. I would also add that it acknowledges that we're in it together. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over now to Marilyn Serapini and to, to introduce the task force panel uh, members here. So Marilyn, it's up to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. 
Um, I would like to introduce our panel uh, who's going to uh, dis uh, help us to understand what's in the report. They're gonna go over the highlights of the report. The five panelists who are with us today are members of our task force. We have two of our co-chairs with us today, uh, former Senator and Majority Leader Tom Daschle. Uh, who's also a co-founder of the BPC. We have uh, Senator Olympia Snow, former Senator Olympia Snow of Maine, who is also a co-chair of the task force. She's also a senior fellow and a board member of the BPC. We have former Congressman Tom Talkey of Iowa with us, and also Chris Jennings, who is founder and president of Jennings Policy Strategies. Uh, you'll also remember that he was uh, in the, both the Clinton and the Obama White Houses working on health care. And he is a senior fellow also at BPC. And we also have Gail Walensky, who's senior fellow at Project Hope. She's also a former administrator of the Healthcare Financing Administration, which of course we now know as a CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So um, I'd like to just repeat a couple of the housekeeping points that uh, Bill Hoagland went over. First, if you have a question, at any time during this event, you may go ahead and ask it. You will click on the Q&A feature of Zoom and uh, go ahead and submit your question. Um, at the appropriate time, I will go ahead and I will ask the panelists as many of the questions as, uh, as we have time for. Um, you will also notice that there's a chat function in, in your Zoom um, uh, buttons. If you click on chat, you will not be speaking with one another, but what you can use chat for is to receive information from us at the BPC. For example, right now our staff has posted the link to our report. So if you would like to see the link to our report, go ahead and open chat. You will see the, um, the URL for that and, and you can see the report. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you is that uh, you have either gotten into Zoom, but you can, uh, the other way to watch this webinar is through YouTube. And the way to do that is to go to uh, BPC's web uh, site. It's uh, bipartisanpolicy.org. Click on events to get to our events page and you will see a link to, um, to watch this there. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our task force members who will uh, go through the highlights of our report, and we're going to go ahead and start with Senator Daschle. So, Senator, over to you. Marilyn, thank you very much. As Marilyn and Bill have both noted, today we announced the release of our recommendations on the Rural Health Task Force. For the last year, my colleagues and I have worked to find common ground to stabilize and improve the challenges facing rural communities. Even before the stresses of COVID-19, these problems were urgent. As a Senator representing South Dakota, I've long understood that the population in rural America is older and sicker, and the people in rural America are less likely to have insurance. As COVID-19 continues to spread across the country, the situation for rural communities is more dire than ever before. Now South Dakota is the nation's number one hotspot for the coronavirus because of the latest outbreak at Smithfield Foods. This virus has no borders and shows how fragile the rural healthcare system really is. More than 100 rural hospitals have closed since 10, uh, 2010. And today, nearly 600 are at risk of folding. That leaves people in rural areas with no choice but to drive long distances to get the health care they need. Too often, they simply forego that care completely. Add COVID-19 to the MISC, and struggling rural hospitals are now desperate. The coronavirus has significant financial uh, has caused significant financial pressures to these hospitals, many of which are laying off and furloughing employees. Some are laying off as much as half of their entire staff. Like other hospitals around the country, they postponed elective procedures, 
And while some hospitals can absorb the financial impact, many rural hospitals don't have profit margins that would allow that. <clears throat> Congress has responded to COVID-19 with legislation and regulation that has opened the doors in new ways for patients to receive care from clinicians, breaking down partners' uh, barriers, I should say, to health uh, with, with telehealth in particular. Many of these measures are temporary, however, and while COVID-19 will eventually uh, end the, the need for telehealth and rural services, we will see an even greater reliance on these approaches as time goes forward. Following site visits in Iowa, New Hampshire, Maine, Wisconsin, Tennessee, and Vermont, and numerous interviews with rural health experts and stakeholders, our task force today is releasing policy recommendations that will help stabilize rural hospitals in the short term and create pathways for them to transform over the long term. But to transform in ways that meet the changing needs of rural communities. We're also recommending policy changes to make it easier for rural providers to move to value-based care, to encourage clinicians to come to rural areas and stay there, to stop the wave of obstetric unit closures and to improve access to care by breaking down barriers to those telehealth services. I'm gonna turn it over now to Olympia, one of my fellow task force co-chairs. Unfortunately, as Marilyn and Bill noted, two of our other co-chairs couldn't be with us today, Ronnie Musgrove and, and uh, Tommy Thompson, uh, but they've been very invaluable as we've continued in our work over the last year. With that, Olympia. Thank you, uh, Tom, and um, I certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to join other members of the task force here today on this uh, webinar. And I also want to express my appreciation uh, to the Bipartisan Policy Center and the Helmsley Charitable Trust for making this task force possible uh, in the first place on such a critical and timely issue, and particularly now in the midst of this uh, pandemic. Um, as one who represented uh, Maine uh, for many years in both the House and Senate, I'm certainly familiar with all of the issues uh, surrounding uh, the challenges confronting um, rural hospitals and rural clinics and rural services overall in, in rural communities. So I'm pleased to be a part of this initiative. I principally will focus on the recommendations in our task force regarding the substantial number of uh, rural hospital closures that have occurred over this last decade and that Senator uh, Daschle uh, described as well. And, and we know the financial pressures uh, that have certainly been exacerbated, uh, you know, as a result of, of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, we wanted to address a, a number of these issues uh, that we think are really important to the sustainability of rural uh, facilities. We know that traditionally uh, care has been uh, made, uh, centered uh, in inpatient hospital settings. And uh, many patients today, of course, now receive uh, their care in both community settings uh, as well as in outpatient. So that has contributed to a significant decline in hospital revenue. To enable uh, communities and rural facilities to transition to a model that makes sense. And we recognized uh, in the task force uh, that every community has differing needs. Uh, so we decided first and foremost was to develop recommendations to stabilize rural hospitals and rural clinics by first providing immediate financial relief over the next three years, because we think that that is a time frame that's essential uh, for communities to make the transition to transformation uh, models. Now, Congress uh, could do this in part first by providing immediate financial relief from the 2% reduction in Medicare that is known as sequestration, as well as relief from Medicare bed debt uh, payment reductions. Um, Congress did in the emergency relief package to address the pandemic, included a temporary suspension of the sequestration cuts uh, through the end of 2020. Uh, we also propose in, in our recommendations that Congress should increase uh, financial assistance in, in terms of reimbursement to Medicare critical access hospitals by 3%. 
critical, uh, currently these hospitals receive about 101% uh, of their costs. Um, when you consider the sequestration cuts that have occurred, it really results in 99% of their costs being reimbursed. So obviously uh, they don't break even. So by providing the 3% increase in conjunction with the Medicare sequester relief, that would be a net reimbursement to critical access hospitals uh, that would equal about 104% of their cost. We happen to think that this level of funding would enable them uh, to re remain uh, operating and at the same time, uh, build and invest in stronger healthcare uh, services. Now, these measures you know, are temporary. Uh, as I said, intended to stabilize rural hospitals and rural clinics as they determine uh, the best pathway forward. Uh, we also propose in our task force report um, establishing pathways for transformation. Uh, so that these measures are flexible uh, in that we include various payment models uh, that will fit uh, the needs of specific uh, communities. Uh, we also require, or for those who want to make this transformation possible, uh, for communities and rural facilities to participate in a community needs assessment and to submit a hospital transformation plan. Uh, that community needs assessment is similar to the assessments that are currently conducted uh, by rural hospitals, but it would also include input uh, from all of the stakeholders in a, in a particular community to ensure that the transformation plan reflects the needs of that community. Uh, one of the first models we propose is called the Rural Emergency and Outpatient Hospital Designation, or called RIO. Uh, this would allow uh, you know, rural hospitals to transform from an inpatient uh, hospital facility to one that provides outpatient emergency services or other services such as extended care services. We also include uh, several payment models. Uh, one that would include 110% cost-based reimbursement, others uh, global payments. Uh, the third uh, is a Medicare outpatient perspective payment system, either in combined with a grant uh, for other services or based on uh, per member per visit, um, predicated on the number of the anticipated patients uh, in a specific community. Another model uh, that we propose is called the Extended Rural Services or ERS. And under this model, it would allow uh, rural hospitals uh, that either close or no longer provide certain services. Uh, it would, could prompt a federal qualified health centers or rural health clinics from adding these services and being paid for them that are no longer available in the hospital, such as urgent care or emergency services or both. And then finally, we also call upon the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation uh, to develop quickly proposals uh, that would call together uh, multiple payers and providers based on a global uh, budget model, similar to the global payment model that is currently being tested uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. And then finally, we also are calling upon the center uh, to promote models for the integration of rural um, healthcare clinics as well as rural hospitals. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Gail Wilinski, to be talking about the transformation of clinician payments. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as uh, Senator Snow uh, indicated, I'm gonna be focusing on clinician payments uh, and maternal care. While we have seen the country as a whole moving toward value-based care, uh, this has been much harder and much slower in rural areas. Some of the quality reporting requirements can overwhelm smaller practices and lower volume of services there uh, means that there are fewer to spread the overhead costs over. And so it makes it difficult for rural providers to take on financial risk. Our task force has recommended a number of technical fixes to the current payment system to enable more of the patient-centered care, including eliminating coinsurance for care management services. We've suggested using readily available Medicare claims data 
to reduce the administrative burden of quality reporting. Ultimately, Medicare's Innovation Center will need to increase access to payment demonstrations that are flexible enough to meet the varied needs of rural communities. Our task force has made several important recommendations to improve maternal care uh, in rural areas. While maternal and infant mortality, unfortunately, has been increasing across the country, the rates are higher in rural areas. Partly, this has been caused by a lack of access to local obstetric services. Between the years 20, 2004 and 2014, for example, 9% of rural hospitals closed their obstetric units, leaving half of rural counties without any hospital-based maternal care at all. One study found that the loss of these services resulted in an increase both in preterm births and births that occur outside of the hospital. To make sure that women can receive adequate prenatal care and to continue being able to deliver their babies locally, the task force recommends increasing the reimbursement for obstetric services. Medicaid covers more than half of the deliveries and there is a lot of variation in state payment rates. Many of the rural hospitals, as we've heard, aren't even breaking even. The secretary of HHS should be able to reimburse rural hospitals for obstetrics care in the health professional shortage areas at the national median commercial rate. We also recommend that Congress increase funding for educational training programs to make sure that primary care clinicians will have the necessary skills to deliver prenatal care and other maternal services. I'm now gonna turn this over to Chris Jennings, who will talk about our workforce recommendations. Chris. Thank you, Gail. Uh, it's certainly no secret that rural areas face significant healthcare workforce shortages, both for primary care clinicians and also for specialists. And it will be an old movie that has the same ending if we don't more effectively highlight problems, produce new and viable policies and make a compelling case for change and effective implementation. So let's start with the compelling problems. It is undeniable that we have a rural health primary care shortfall and without action, it will clearly get worse before it gets better. Rural areas have only 40 primary care physicians for every 100,000 people. And that compares with 53 in urban areas, but that gap is so much greater for specialists. Rural areas have 30 specialists for every 100,000 people compared to 263 specialists in urban areas. And to be clear uh, and to address many of the issues that members and Bill have raised, that disparity is much worse when it, when it comes to access considerations related to the long distance that are often between providers and patients. To make matters worse, nearly a third of primary care providers in rural areas are over the age of 56 and nearing retirement. And this picture may be even worse than it appears when it comes to primary care shortages, because it appears that nurse practitioners and physician assistants are actually classified as primary care clinicians, even when they are practicing as specialists. So yes, amongst our first recommendations is to make sure we have a clear line of sight into the problem by recommending that the Health Services and, uh, the, and Service Administration, HRSA, assign a specific specialty classification to the clinicians so we have a more accurate assessment of the problem we face. And as we do that, we of course recommend an independent review. In this case, we would suggest by either GAO or the National Academy of Sciences of all rural workforce programs within HRSA to determine which programs are actually effective, which should be prioritized, amended, and sunset. But the task force clearly was not satisfied on waiting for another review when we face a rural health crisis now. And if you know these members, uh, that shouldn't surprise you. 
Uh, we strongly believe you can't expect the same old policy to deliver new results. As such, because of our experience in this area, the task force has concluded we know enough now to make some new recommendations and to take some bold actions. To that end, we are recommending incentives that would both encourage clinicians who move to rural areas to stay there and also to make greater use of the existing workforce. So first, the task force recommends providing federal tax credits to clinicians who practice in rural areas. This is not being done now. While incentives such as loan forgiveness programs already bring some clinicians into rural areas, keeping, their, keeping them there has real, really been a challenge. And tax credits in two states, Oregon and New Mexico, for example, have already proven effective for retention, one of the most difficult objectives any community face. Although the state experience is encouraging, we believe the limited number of states and the inadequacy of the tax credits are suppressing the potential for this policy. And in the current COVID-19 environment, states simply will not have the ability to lose even more revenue through tax credits at the very time that they're losing all this revenue coming into their coffers. As such, we would recommend as an example, a tripling of the value of these credits in escalating amounts over three years. Second, the task force also recommends that we notably expand the number of J-1 visas from the so-called Conrad 30 to 50. These visas allow international medical graduates to stay in the U US for an additional three years to practice in shortage areas. Third, the task force embraces the importance of making greater use of the existing workforce. We recommended that the HHS secretary assess the impact of expanding Medicare reimbursement to healthcare providers that it currently does not cover, such as pharmacists and social workers. We also believe with a strong case could be made that the effective use of these providers could enhance the overall value and medical outcome of the patients they serve. And also there is a clearly a documented urgent need for additional behavioral health care services. And we know that in particular through the isolation issues that many of us are aware of. Medicare does not cover marriage and family therapists and licensed mental health care counselors. This is, e this is the case even though they are included in the Public Health Service Act and they may call be called into service by the National Health Service Corps. We believe Medicare should step up and cover these providers. We have more recommendations in this area that I encourage you to review as our prescription for aggressively moving forward. But for my last duty, I reflect on the past. 30 years ago this year, I had the privilege of staffing the so-called Pepper Commission. One of its smartest members was Congressman Tom Talkey, who even then was a compelling advocate of addressing the unique challenges of rural healthcare in new and innovative ways. It's now my pleasure to turn this over to the Congressman to discuss our recommendations on telehealth. Thank you very much, Chris, now that I'm unmuted. It is good, it has been great to uh, work again with you and with all of the members of the task force. Uh, some 30 years ago, when uh, Congressman Mike Sinar and I co-founded the Rural Health Caucus in the House, we believed that technology was a key to delivering healthcare services in rural America. Of course, then it was just a dream. Today, it's becoming a reality. This task force sees health IT as, an, as essential uh, to expanding access to care in rural areas. The response to COVID-19 has focused on getting care to people who cannot see their doctors face to face. There, this is an everyday problem before COVID-19 and will be after in rural areas where people live long distances from medical care. After the threat of COVID-19 has passed, rural residents will continue to need telehealth and other virtual technologies. One good thing emerging from the COVID-19 epidemic is that Congress and the Trump administration waived many Medicare restrictions for telehealth, easing restrictions around the site of service and also allowing telehealth for patients who were not already est established with a clinician. 
There are all new, also new flexibilities allowing phone calls and other non-visual visits to be paid for. Congress has temp temporarily allowed a patient's home to be an originating telehealth site. This is very important. Uh, these changes simply make sense. And one key to making telehealth a real option for rural Americans. This change, the, all of these changes should be permanent and they should not require a waiver. Rural health clinics and FQHCs also should be permanently allowed as distant telehealth sites. These changes, which uh, have been made in response to COVID-19, are consistent with the task force recommendations, so we've been pleased to see them implemented. In addition to these changes, Congress also should allow clinicians to provide services to Medicare beneficiaries across state borders and eligibility of telehealth payment services should be based on where the provider is located instead of where the patient is located. Right now, a clinician must get a separate license in each state where he or she is providing telehealth services, which can limit the ability of providers to offer care in rural communities. COVID-19 has provided us with a valuable learning experience to see how well some of these changes are working and how we can use them after this pandemic. They have demonstrated that telehealth can function well, very well in connecting patients and their clinicians. And we must make these changes permanent and build upon them. Finally, the task force recommends expanding access to broadband in rural areas. Broadband, of course, is the essential tool for, for providing high quality telehealth services. And yet about a quarter of rural Americans and about a third of those on tribal lands don't have access, don't have access to adequate broadband. Well, with that, my colleagues and I have explained the highlights of our task force's recommendations. Marilyn is now going to let you uh, know where to find the full report and uh, the rest of our recommendations. Marilyn. Fantastic. Thanks to all of the members of the task force. Um, so again, if you are looking for the report, open the chat function in Zoom and you will see a link to the report there. If you would like to ask a question, uh, open up the Q&A. Uh, portion, the Q&A uh, tab in, the, in Zoom, and you will be able to send a question in. I will see those questions, and I will uh, ask as many of the questions to the panelists as time permits. So let's start with uh, the real elephant in the room here, and that's COVID-19. Uh, you know, as Bill mentioned, when we first started working as a task force, uh, we weren't thinking about COVID-19, but now it is, is a reality that's affecting all corners uh, of our country um, and, and including in a big way rural areas. Um, Chris, I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about what we can um, expect. There may be a COVID relief pa uh, package in the Senate today. We know that already there has been a uh, hundred billion dollars uh, legislated for hospitals. Um, there was no indication in that legislation for how that would be split up. Um, so I'd love to hear from all the task force members about what, what we do need. We have been hearing from a number of rural hospitals that, uh, and frankly, all hospitals everywhere, whether rural or urban, that this, that this just isn't enough. Um, for the rural hospitals that have had to uh, uh, put a pause on their elective procedures, and this is where they make their money, they're really having a lot of trouble and we're hearing from some of these hospitals uh, that have already been struggling with you know, less than a week's worth of cash on hand and now they're losing millions of dollars uh, that th they're potentially going to uh, um, 
uh, have to consider cutting back services or folding altogether. So Chris, can you uh, start, uh, kick, us, kick us off here, tee up this conversation, tell us what we can uh, potentially see in the Senate today, what additional help we can see, and then I'd love to have the other panelists jump in with, with their thoughts. Sure, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. And uh, as uh, most of these members of Congress can attest, this is when you have moments like this, um, much work gets done over very intense periods of time and you're kind of digging out exactly what you've just passed <laughs> occasionally. And we're definitely reading through that now. Uh, last night, there was an agreement for another $450 billion for COVID-19 related activities. Apparently, $100 billion of that $450 are going to be dedicated for additional healthcare investments, a full $75 billion for hospitals. Uh, and there is some initial reporting that a significant portion, probably that means a little bit more than a disproportionate portion, of that may be going to rural areas. Um, there is a lot of members who are extremely concerned about the infrastructure challenges uh, and service challenges that this disease poses on their communities. We're seeing that being raised in a host of other areas as well. And that gets applied, for example, to testing too, testing capacity, testing distribution, um, and so there continues to be a debate amongst Democrats and Republicans on the administration about how best to allocate this testing, how to ensure capacity, how to distribute it, um, with the Democrats hoping for a little bit more um, federal leadership and the president indicating a little bit more comfort with relying on local and state communities to make some decisions. So um, all of which is to say, uh, yes, you mentioned there was $100 billion for providers last round. This is another $100 billion of health care. There is likely to be uh, almost inevitably to be a big push for a 4.0 version of a COVID-19 proposal. This is now called 3.5. And uh, I anticipate that debate starting within hours after we pass this one. It is now anticipated the Senate will pass this policy later this afternoon with the house passing soon thereafter, but um, uh, we need to watch it and dig through the details to see the exact allocation and formulas. Can I get other uh, members of our panel to weigh in if they if they would like? How what is the appropriate way to look? All hospitals are really struggling here, um, uh, so how do we? what makes sense? What, what is the proportion of funding? Do we even know? Is there a proportion that should be set aside for rural? Well, we need to understand that hospitals were struggling before this. Uh, 2018 was the first time that uh, hospitals were seeing positive operating margins after several years uh, of not having that happen. Uh, and so there is not a lot of resiliency uh, for many hospitals. Uh, rural hospitals have had even more challenges, uh, but this has been a, a pretty challenging uh, time in general. And so it's recognizing that the COVID crisis is coming on what had already been a fiscally uh, stressed time. When we talk about testing, I think we're going to uh, have to be smart about how we approach it. Um, we need to think about the advantages of sampling to give us a hint about those areas where there needs to be uh, aggressive involvement and those areas where you may be able to have more selective uh, involvement. Uh, there is no way in the near term we're going to have enough testing available for 100% of the 330 million of us to get tested, nor should that be necessary. But you do wanna to go to the areas and the populations that are most at risk, do testing there and let that guide as to whether or not you need to do more testing in an area uh, or whether you can move on there. There is some notion of how sampling can help so that we can use these resources in a smart way. 
Following up on what Gail said, uh, many of the rural hospitals were in trouble financially already. And, uh, but their, their COVID-19 virus has exacerbated the problem insofar as it has caused many facilities not to engage in normal routine activities, or especially elective surgeries and that kind of thing. And as a result, their revenue is going down as a result of COVID-19. So the aid from the federal government uh, to these rural hospitals is really important in order for these hospitals to be able to survive. And it's justified because of the fact that the uh, it's government policies that have resulted in this temporary, at least, reduction in assistance to rural hospitals. I don't know what's in the bill relating to telehealth, but I certainly hope that there is also uh, financial support for the advancement uh, of the kinds of things I talked about in the that are in the report relating to uh, telehealth because that is a, a, an avenue for delivering the services and ensuring that there's reimbursement for those services are, that are delivered via telehealth is really critical. I would just add, oh, yeah, ahead, I, yeah, I just would uh, add, I think it's been uh, summed up well, and obviously we don't know, you know, the approach that uh, Congress will take in this particular relief package, but I think Chris is right. I think it'll, it'll go in multiple stages, but it is really important for Congress to really get a handle on the scale of the problem that exists for hospitals across this country, and most especially in rural hospitals. I know the Maine CDC director, for example, yesterday indicated there's a spike now in, in uh, rural parts of Maine, and it's true in other states across the country, um, already facing the enormity of you know, financial problems and this only magnifies it, but I think it's gonna be important for Congress to understand exactly, you know, what is the, the breadth of the problem that exists for hospitals and multiple levels. Uh, as has been mentioned, many, many of the hospitals have obviously have had to forego elective surgeries, not receiving any revenue. Um, and I know some of the hospitals here in Maine have already furloughed, you know, employees, reduced salaries, uh, and so, it's becoming, uh, I think, a, a more of a greater challenge. And so I, I think it's gonna be important for, uh, you know, those of us who are on, on the front lines in this report, but also for hospitals to be able to communicate uh, to their elected officials exactly what is transpiring. So both to deal with the immediacy of the problem in response to the COVID crisis, but also the, the cascading effect that it is having on hospitals that are already under great uh, financial constraint. I could just pick up on what Olympia just said. I, I think it's important for us, obviously, to keep our focus on the short term and dealing with the crisis as it continues to expand throughout rural, rural areas. Uh, obviously, that's first and foremost. But I think we have to do it with an eye to the longer term as well. One day, the COVID-19 crisis will end, uh, or at least diminish. And then we're gonna have circumstances involving the infrastructure that we're gonna to have to address. And I think it's important for us to think of it in, in four buckets, obviously resources. We've talked about a need for resources in a, in a series of different uh, capacities, but resources are critical, including increasing the reimbursement rate for critical access hospitals and finding ways to, to deal with the sequestration issue that could take effect next next year. I mean, there are a number of things that we have to look at in addition to telehealth that uh, will require more resources, but that's just the first bucket. The second is regulatory. We've got to figure out ways to ensure that there is more regulatory flexibility for hospitals and providers. And that regulatory relief and that flexibility and pragmatic approach uh, as we look at applications in rural America is really essential. The third is workforce. We've got to understand that the workforce in rural America in particular is, is, is continuing to become even greater, uh, a, a, a far greater problem. And so scope of practice issues and, and setting uh, the National Health Service Corps and other, other ways to, to really uh, augment our workforce is really going to be critical. And of course, telemedicine plays into that. And then finally, uh, the final bucket is just a recognition of the need for a transformation away from the way we've looked at healthcare financing in the past to value-based and, and social determinant-based approaches to healthcare going forward. All four of those buckets are going to be critical, not only in the short term, but as we look at the long term too. 
Okay, thank you, Senator. Congressman Talkie, I wanted to get back to you regarding uh, telehealth. You mm -hmm. uh, you laid out what has already happened and the, and the progress, the incredible progress we've made uh, in a very short period of time. One of our questioners is, is asking about the emphasis on Medicare. Um, a lot of what we're talking about really is coming through Medicare, yet we have a lot of uh, people in this country in Medicaid and in uh, commercial insurance, commercial coverage. So how does all of this apply to them? And, and, and uh, you know, I'd love for others to jump in as well, but will they be able to take advantage of some of this progress? And what more do we need to do there? Well, as as uh, Senator Daschle just said, regulations are so important, uh, and uh, a lot of the regulatory uh, issues and payment issues relating to uh, Medicare uh, have been addressed uh, to permit telehealth. Uh, depending on the state, uh, there are other issues relating to payments that affect insurance companies and also Medicaid, and so it's a, it is a fairly sec, a very like complex set of issues uh, that confront the telehealth providers and telehealth services in, uh, in throughout the country. And it varies from uh, state to state, what is permitted and what is not permitted and what are the payment schedules. So there's a lot to do. The federal government can do a big portion of it, but uh, states are also important. There is an article that just appeared in the Des Moines Register in my home state of Iowa um, on April 13th and it was entitled Rapid Rollout of Telehealth Services in Iowa. We're just going crazy with it, one doctor says. And it outlined uh, uh, many of the challenges confronting uh, telehealth, as well as how there's been this explosion of uh, telehealth services in the state of Iowa. And from that article, there were just three things that I think uh, I wanted to, that, pull, that I pulled out as lessons. I guess the first is, is that the waivers that we have relating to payments and relating to the ability to deliver services, those things need to be made permanent and more regulatory reform is needed to facilitate telehealth. Second is, is that we need simplicity in our health care system generally. These federal programs and the state programs and all of the different uh, requirements and uh, hoops that one has to jump through in order to qualify for this payment or that payment, it's so complex. And these rural areas, the, particularly the rural health providers, whether it's the doctor who's practicing alone or whether it's a rural health hospital, they don't have the staff to be able to just manage and, uh, all of these requirements. And so simplifying uh, the uh, requirements is so important for these smaller uh, providers. And then third, we need investment in broadband, uh, as I alluded to earlier. Now, one point relating to that is mo many rural areas, a lot of rural areas are served by rural telephone companies or rural cable companies, co-ops in many instances. There are thousands, over a thousand small telephone companies across the country. They receive a lot of federal assistance through various means in order to provide service to the, uh, their customers. And their broadband is really quite good. The problem, the big problem is in rural areas served by the large companies in the country, the AT&T, Verizon, uh, those companies. They don't receive that kind of reimbursement to, to serve rural areas, and they don't have the incentive to make the investment as a result. Something needs to be done to address the service, broadband service to rural areas that are served by the large companies where there is no federal subsidy or assistance in order to encourage the uh, delivery of the infrastructure that is necessary in those areas. So, I think if we look at those things, one, how to get investment in broadband, two, how to simplify all, all the requirements, and three, how to provide the regulatory relief by making some of these waivers permanent and then doing other regulatory structure, that's going to do a lot to help the rural areas. Would anybody else like to weigh in on that before we move on? Okay, so um, the report recommendations focus uh, heavily on stabilizing rural hospitals, 
um, on a temporary basis to give them the opportunity to transform into uh, other kinds of models that best meet the community's needs. Why do we need to even think about these kinds of transformations? Do we currently have a mismatch between what some of these hospitals, uh, a full service hospital and what the community needs? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we're hearing uh, today about uh, some of the responses uh, that are already being proposed. Um, I think uh, we are going to see changes that have started as a result of the COVID experience uh, that are not gonna go away. Uh, I don't think we are going to revert back uh, to some of the restrictions uh, because we've all been able to experience some of the benefits of allowing greater flexibility. Um, uh, just as we're speaking now uh, from our uh, various homes uh, to share these views, uh, telehealth is going to change. It has been very important uh, in some rural areas uh, for years. Uh, it has improved significantly uh, since I first observed it uh, being used in the early 1990s. Uh, when I was quite convinced I wouldn't want to have my body uh, being uh, affected uh, using some of the uh, telehealth that was available then. The transmission capability uh, it has improved significantly. Uh, the introduction of broadband in many areas and the need uh, to continue doing this. Uh, what we're going to have to do uh, is to sit back uh, when we are uh, out of the COVID emergency uh, and understand the benefits that we have experienced uh, going through this period uh, and choose to adopt those that have been very helpful. Uh, telehealth, I think, is going to fundamentally change how healthcare is delivered, uh, especially important for rural areas, uh, frankly, very important for central cities uh, as well, where the distances may not be as great by the time it takes in order to uh, get to healthcare services can be significant. Uh, I think uh, you will see many of the changes uh, in Medicare, in Medicaid uh, and commercial payers uh, be pressed to go forward even once we're outside of this emergency period we're in now and all for the better. If I could just add another thing to what Gail, just to emphasize something Tom had said earlier, uh, telehealth is really gonna be critical, but critical to telehealth is broadband. And we have some real serious challenges in many parts of rural America, especially in South Dakota. There are many parts in South Dakota that still struggle to acquire even the necessary fundamental uh, character of broadband to be able to 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 access telehealth act, uh, effectively. So we're going to have to recognize that broadband issues are still unaddressed in many parts of rural America, and we've got to put more resources and far more priority on acquisition of good broadband if we're going to produce the kind of telehealth, telehealth services that are going to be necessary going forward. I think if, if anything, uh, this is obviously going to accelerate uh, these initiatives and, and most certainly should because technology implementation has basically been fractured across this country, been lagging investments for, for decades. I you know, I spearheaded the E-rate, uh, for example, when we were revising our telecommunication laws. Uh, but you know, you think about where we are today, where we should be. Uh, so some of the changes that have been given, you know, a temporary designation in the emergency relief package should become permanent. Uh, you know, we should begin this process now because we have to remedy the gaps that exist in our healthcare system and most certainly in the rural communities. And so this will provide greater attention and it's going because of the immediacy of the problem, the urgency uh, that exists and what we need to do as a country to provide a comprehensive examination of these issues and to address them in a concerted way. 
Senator Snow, let me get you, you to get you to uh, uh, expand on that a, a bit. And I want to get back to the uh, hospital transformations. Uh, we have proposals to allow uh, one of the pathways, at least would allow hospitals to transition into um, something that would look more like a standalone emergency department, plus some outpatient services, plus um, maybe some observation beds and, and such. Now, uh, of course, the task force wrote these recommendations before we were uh, intensely in the middle of a COVID pan pandemic. Uh, and one of our questioners is asking, uh, is that going to, could that potentially cause us to have a shortage of hospital beds when, uh, especially like ICU beds, uh, when they are potentially most needed. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, why the task force decided to have some flexibility in these proposals? Well, the, you know, um, primarily, of course, you know, during the course of our site visits, and we heard from a wide range of stakeholders, as you know, uh, about the need for flexibility, you know, to develop, you know, financially sustainable models. Um, obviously, this would occur over three years. Uh, you know, it would be three years for the immediate financial relief that I cited earlier, uh, both from the sequestration cuts, but also uh, in addition to the additional assistance that, that we recommend Congress provide. Uh, for reimbursements that we think is important. So it would give them, this would be a stabilizer. We can obviously, communities can then assess, you know, how they want to proceed and particularly in the aftermath, you know, of this uh, COVID crisis and what the impact will be on various communities and they can incorporate that into the community needs assessment. Uh, but we wouldn't expect this to take place, obviously, as they're making this transition you know, for the, in the next three years through 2023, uh, for example. And they can incorporate all these changes and then can determine, you know, what essentially uh, would be their requirements, for example, in the number of beds, or what type of facilities would better serve their community. But I think that, uh, I think the attribute of our recommendation, it gives flexibilities uh, to the communities to determine what option or what model may work for them. And they're not required, by the way, uh, to make this transformation. Uh, that is a choice and that is an option uh, that would be available to communities as they rethink about what their needs are in their particular community. And that's, that's why it's so important to bring all the stakeholders together, an array between the health department, uh, you know, local, uh, social service organizations, providers, uh, you know, minority populations, uh, the tribal representatives. I mean, so that we have a variety of stakeholders who will have the ability uh, to provide the kind of information that'll be important to make this decision. But I think also what's important is that this is not an immediate change. Uh, this would happen gradually over time. And at any point in which the community and the rural hospitals decide they wanna proceed down this transformational path, they could, you know, they could ultimately adopt a transformational a transformation model and then decide that they want to revert back, you know, for example, to be a, a critical access hospital. Uh, so they could pivot back and forth, you know, in, in the future, you know, if they determine uh, that's what was warranted. Yeah, well, I'm wondering if you could add a little bit to that to talk about, in, in addition to uh, uh, creating new transformation pathways, the task force also decided to provide various opportunities for how to pay hospitals. And you spoke a little bit about this before. Um, why the need to provide some flexibility in this area? And also, where do you think we're, we're headed or where we should be headed in terms of payment? Where do you, how do you see us moving forward here? Um, the reason for flexibility and the need for flexibility uh, is that um, the rural areas in particular uh, um, don't have uh, many of the resources that the urban areas with their higher density uh, have uh, can draw on. Uh, what we were talking about, uh, for example, in the need for bar a broadband 
uh, is not an issue uh, in most uh, urban areas. So we just need to be smarter, uh, recognizing that we need to uh, show some flexibility, greater flexibility uh, than has been available in the past. Uh, it was why my comment that I think uh, the results of being forced to be more flexible as a result of the COVID-19 experience it is gonna mean that healthcare delivery, particularly the use of telehealth uh, as a more normal way uh, for clinicians and patients to interact uh, is going to change how healthcare is delivered going forward. It will be especially important uh, uh, in the rural areas because of the low density uh, and high distances that are frequently required and because of the scarcity uh, in some areas uh, of certain types of specialists, uh, but it is gonna change everywhere. Uh, I think the genie's out of the bottle now. Uh, people have realized uh, how convenient uh, it can be that uh, with the use uh, of uh, uh, visual communication that is possible uh, now as a result uh, of uh, um, sites like uh, Zoom or other uh, means to have a telehealth, uh, you can have many of the interactions uh, between clinicians and patients without forcing them uh, to actually be physically present. Not for everything, of course, uh, but for a lot. Uh, the problem uh, and uh, as somebody who is a former administrator, uh, I understood uh, the reason for some of the inflexibility is that uh, governments are pressed uh, to be fair in terms of how they treat uh, different areas, uh, to always worry about fraud and abuse uh, and whether areas are, are taking advantage. Uh, but we have been forced to, to realize uh, that rural areas simply need flexibility uh, that has not been available uh, in the law. And that if we want to allow people uh, to remain in rural areas and want to enable them uh, to receive the kind of uh, health care uh, that they need and deserve, uh, we're going to have to be a little more uh, flexible and find other ways uh, to address any other uh, kinds of concerns. I would just add, add, uh, uh, one of the things I would add is that, as you know, Marilyn, we consistently heard, you know, from the stakeholders that a one size fits all solution simply doesn't work, right? So I think that that is, you know, the value uh, of the approach that we've taken in, in this report to give them the options and then they can design it to what best suits their uh, local healthcare delivery needs. Uh, Marilyn, as you alluded to earlier, when we uh, were deliberating about uh, the issues that are contained in this report, it was before COVID-19 hit. And much of what we saw was is that the healthcare systems in the rural areas had been structured for uh, earlier years when there were more patients, longer hospital stays, and so on. And so part of uh, our deliberation was focused on how to make the system more efficient and more sustainable. And uh, that would result in some cases in, for example, fewer hospital beds in the communities. Now with COVID-19, all of a sudden we have a little different perspective than perhaps the perspective we had when we were deliberating about these issues. And that is, is that now all of a sudden there is a need for uh, the ability to suddenly have an influxes of patients and you have the capacity to need, meet this uh, immediate a uh, very substantial need. And it's hard to do that in uh, areas where you don't have uh, the uh, financial resources uh, to sustain that kind of uh, facility and infrastructure. So I think we face a real dilemma uh, in the country as a whole, but particularly in rural areas, about how much infrastructure can you sustain for the kind of pandemic or the emergency situation like we're facing now uh, versus uh, what you can sustain for the ongoing. And that really is a question of how much government resources would be put into 
say, more beds in rural areas than you need uh, on an ongoing basis. So I think the uh, question that uh, you asked is an interesting one and one that uh, has arisen as a result of this uh, experience of the last couple months. And uh, so uh, it probably wasn't given full consideration by us. I also think one last point about this issue, which will be debated, uh, what is our response going forward on capacity? Um, and that's gonna have implications for rural and urban areas, of course, but is this issue of uh, how we can better prevent the demand on capacity in the first place. And that, that really gets to more Sentinel uh, capabilities, more testing capabilities, infrastructure, more prevention. Uh, we're, we're also seeing a whole host of social societal problems right now uh, that are being exposed in very meaningful ways. Uh, so there's going to be a huge reflection about uh, how uh, on what we've just gone through, how we reacted to it, what what remains in its place, and how we should change it. And and it's you know in some ways it's it's exciting because in some ways it may kick us in the pants to address some of these issues that we all know for a long period of time have gone unaddressed. So. Pick up on something. Oh, go ahead, Chris. No, I'm. I'm. That's 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 all I wanted to say. Thank you, Senator. Well, I just wanted to to elaborate on on one point Chris made, and that is the importance of public health, in not only in rural areas but across the board. I, I was shocked recently to learn that we lost fifty thousand jobs in public health. Twenty over twenty five percent of the workforce in public health between two thousand eight and two thousand seventeen. So we've seen a devastating attrition of public health officials at the local and, and, and state level that really uh, accounts for a lot of the, the, uh, the proactive work we should do to avoid these kinds of situations going forward. We've got to recognize more of a need and a far greater investment in public health than we have in recent years. Let me just uh, put in uh, one uh, uh, question uh, to my colleagues that has been troubling me. Um, we're going to feel torn between being able to respond to the need for surge capacity, but not wanting to have on an ongoing basis the volume of beds or uh, ICUs uh, or other expensive uh, healthcare facilities uh, that would be required uh, during a pandemic or other emergency. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about how we can be smarter and how we accommodate the need for surge capacity uh, will again be one of these um, issues uh, when we get through this current crisis uh, that will require smart heads uh, to think calmly about. Uh, the use of the mercy and the comfort uh, in California and New York, uh, setting up uh, field hospitals uh, in the Javits Center, I mean, there are a lot of interesting things that have been forced on us. Uh, it will be uh, useful to sit back afterward, incumbent on all of us uh, that care about these issues, to think about how to be better prepared for the next time something like this happens, because as we all know, it will. We don't know when and we don't know what the cause will be, but we can be quite confident it will happen again. Let me actually uh, uh, add to what Gail is, is saying here. Um, one of the proposals of the task force, one of the pathways to transformation involves global budgets. And uh, Gail, I'd like to hear what you have to say and what some of the others have to say about uh, how global budgets could potentially uh, provide some flexibility to healthcare systems and to states as a whole to, uh, to pivot. Um, we know that uh, Pennsylvania is at the beginning stages of testing a global payment model. And uh, the recommendation of our task force has been to ask the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that's within CMS to, um, to look at how to 
expand on that model so that it could be uh, workable for other states? Because we do know that the Pennsylvania model was geared specifically for Pennsylvania. Well, the idea of global payments is to get government to step back uh, and not put constraints on the various elements in spending that a state or a hospital uh, or a physician might have to be accounted for. Uh, we've been moving in the direction of more and more global payments uh, since the 1980s uh, when prospective payment uh, was adopted as a model to reimburse hospitals uh, under Medicare, uh, where the payment was based on the diagnosis at discharge uh, and precisely how that payment uh, was used uh, was left more uh, up to the hospital. Uh, there are various issues that have arisen uh, about whether and how to account for quality uh, when you get global payments uh, and whether or not to put uh, some kind of reporting requirements uh, or uh, quality uh, requirements in. But the basic idea is to give the state or the hospital a governmental unit more flexibility uh, in how that funding uh, is spent. And I think that is going to continue uh, going forward in the future. The real quid pro quo, uh, either as government uh, or as us, the potential using uh, public, will be what do we want to know in its place in, res in response uh, for giving uh, greater flexibility uh, to the state or to the institutions, what kind of reporting uh, would make us feel assured uh, in the areas that matter? Uh, is it knowing something about the outcomes? Uh, is it uh, having uh, provisions that certain at-risk populations are, are being uh, properly uh, cared for? Uh, that would be worth our time uh, in the way we pay physicians under Medicare, uh, we move from a very micro level approach uh, with a relative value scale where you had physicians being paid uh, on the basis of 10,000 units uh, to various attempts uh, to try to get a more value-based uh, payment. Uh, we're still struggling uh, in that area uh, with um, more uh, regarding where we are is not quite where we need to be. So these are not easy issues, uh, but I think the notion of getting to uh, broader payments, allowing for more flexibility uh, and deciding what kind of information and assurances need to be provided in return is a far better position to find ourselves in. Great. Uh, so we've been talking really about the hospitals in rural areas uh, up to this point, but I wanted to ask you all about the needs really of uh, clinics. We have um, rural health clinics, oftentimes they're attached to hospitals, and we have federally qualified health centers as well. Uh, one of our models uh, would allow um, uh, a clinic or a federally qualified health center to expand services when the area has lost hospital services uh, or lost the hospital altogether um, to allow them to expand to, uh, to add, say, emergency services and get paid properly to, to add that. So what is, the, what is the issue we're facing here with the, with the clinics? And when we're seeing hospitals disappear, are we seeing uh, other, the clinicians for the clinics disappear as well? What is the need here and why the response we've chosen? I think we need to give a real shout out to the community health centers, Marilyn. They've just done a phenomenal job and we, we find that they're just overwhelmed right now because people have, uh, in many cases, lost their health insurance as a result of the dramatic uh, increase in unemployment. Uh, 22 million Americans have filed for unemployment insurance, unemployment claims, and I, I think uh, as unemployment continues to become even more severe, uh, the clinics around the country, especially in rural America, are feeling the full impact of the additional demand. So resources are going to be critical uh, and, and some degree of recognition of many of the things we've already talked about 
providing them with greater flexibility, making sure we maximize scope of practice, doing all we can to ensure that the uh, clinical uh, uh, infrastructure has the resources and the ability to meet the demand. That's critical, and I don't think we fully appreciated that today. I think there's going to be greater attention to that as we address COVID in future uh, resources, uh, even in the 3.5, uh, as, as I think Chris noted. But uh, as we look to the fourth phase, those resources are going to be essential, and we've got to make sure they're given the priority they deserve. I totally concur, uh, because um, it's clear that rural health clinics uh, play a pivotal role in rural communities. Uh, they principally serve medically underserved areas. Uh, they obviously draw a number of providers that otherwise might not be available in a rural area. Uh, and already 400 rural healthcare uh, clinics have closed since 2012. Uh, federally uh, qualified health centers, uh, I think it says 2012, 600 closed that serve 3.8 million residents and had an impact of 3,600 jobs. Uh, so clearly that, that is uh, devastating and we really do have to recognize and to yeah, provide resources uh, and to elevate the reimbursement uh, as well for rural health clinics. Uh, in fact, I think one of our proposals for independent physician owned uh, clinics uh, that uh, have receive a lesser reimbursement uh, than the hospital rate we uh, recommend providing $115 per visit. And also as Tom uh, indicated, uh, increasing the, uh, the, for nurse practitioners and physician assistants to work up to their state uh, scope of practice so that we can expand the offering. So these are the type of approaches and initiatives that we should be taking, Congress should be evaluating as well. Okay, uh, OB services. We know that uh, hospitals have been closing. When they are not closing or before they close, uh, a lot of these hospitals are cutting their OB uh, services. Uh, this is a very expensive unit for a hospital. We know that, not just in rural areas. And uh, it's generally a money loser for hospitals. So why did the task force recommend increasing payment rates for OB services. The, uh, the task force also uh, recommended trainings for um, uh, primary care clinicians and other clinicians to allow them to uh, better be able to handle uh, uh, prenatal care and, and also frankly deliveries. We, during our site visits, we heard from uh, we heard from uh, one uh, hospital uh, uh, executive that they, uh, that they have stop and drops. And uh, we asked, well, what, what's a stop and drop? And the, uh, uh, the, the guy told us, well, we have a lot of, we don't have OB services, yet we are having a, a lot of pregnant women coming in, they're in labor, they're ready to deliver their baby, but they haven't had a day of prenatal care uh, at all, and we don't have OB services. So we know that uh, the problems with the lack of OB services are affecting um, uh, outcomes, frankly. So um, why is this so important? How big is the problem? And why are we recommending increased payments and, and training? Maybe I just answered all that. I don't know. I was going to, I was going to say, I think you really did uh, answer the, uh, the question for us. Um, if you are going to uh, welcome and encourage uh, young families to stay in rural areas, uh, you need to make it easy for young families to expand uh, and that means having uh, obstetric services available. Uh, you don't want to uh, make it uh, impossible uh, for families to be able uh, to, um, uh, to deliver in the areas, to have to go elsewhere. Uh, so if you're serious uh, about wanting to uh, have uh, rural areas be able to support young families, uh, you need to make sure 
uh, that obstetrical services are there. You need to make sure uh, pediatric care uh, is available. These are the main services uh, young families need. Uh, and without them, uh, you're going to be fighting a losing battle. And, and how big a problem are payment rates for OB services, whether rural or not rural? Uh, this has been a, a struggle because in part the nature of the payment tends to be a single payment uh, that is made for obstetrical services. Um, if you don't have a large number of obstetrical cases, uh, those kinds of averages can cause a real problem. Uh, and it's why uh, several of us in our uh, discussions uh, have particularly pointed out the need uh, to have obstetrical payments uh, which reflect uh, the lower use but very critical nature uh, that uh, having uh, OB services means. Uh, and that was why the recommendation for uh, having them at national averages rather uh, than uh, having it uh, just for the local area uh, that might be uh, involved. Uh, it is really recognizing that if you're going to uh, attract and be able to maintain uh, um, young families in rural areas, you have to provide the services that are more, most important to them. Okay, so let's move on to, we haven't talked a lot about the workforce challenges. Uh, we certainly have a lot of workforce challenges right now with, with COVID-19. But beyond COVID-19 in rural areas, we do have an extensive uh, problem with workforce in rural areas. What makes this, what makes it hard for uh, clinics and hospitals to get people to come to rural areas? And then what are the challenges in getting them to stay there? Why is this such a big problem? I can speak from, from the experience I had over the years representing South Dakota and Maryland that, you know, I think, uh, I think smaller communities struggle these days because they're older, uh, they're sicker, and uh, they have greater demands. A, a physician or a nurse practitioner in a small rural setting is on the job 24 seven. That's exhausting. And um, I think uh, physicians and others uh, in healthcare services are are looking for a more balanced life. And they know that if they move to a, a rural community, they've got enormous demands that are gonna be put upon them unless they can find relief. And so part of the problem is just the challenge of, 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 of the existence of, of, uh, of, of uh, such limited access to, to providers in, in these rural settings. That's, I think that's part of it. You don't have the, uh, oftentimes as, as a physician, as a nurse, you're looking for uh, places to raise children and limited access to other social services, community services, and the kinds of things you expect in, in, in normal suburban and urban settings don't exist in rural America. So it's harder to recruit for that reason. Um, it's why I think we really have to create a robust uh, incentive program, whether it's tax relief, uh, finding ways to ensure that, that uh, these physicians and providers can be compensated more uh, more uh, robustly, uh, given what we know now is uh, just an enormous demand personally on their, on, on them and on their families. Yeah, and I, oh, go ahead, Congressman. No, go ahead, Chris. Well, I, I was just going to say that, um, again, this isn't new, um, but we've seen these challenges forever. And Gail mentioned that the uh, difficulty of attracting spouses as well. You can't just think about the, the physician financial incentive. You have to think about the infrastructure and its, its attractiveness to the family. Um, that becomes harder and harder when you think of these things. I do um, believe that uh, this task force got uh, expressed frustration about just doing the same old, same old, which is why one of our proposals really is to be aggressive on of the whole workforce issue and, and, and to put some new ideas on the table that I outlined previously, so I won't go through them again. 
And I do believe that the telemedicine uh, capabilities, if we can really address the broadband issue, which everyone uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting, uh, you know, pulls our hair out on this issue. And I, 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 I look at Senator Snow and Senator uh, Daschle and Congressman Taki. I know all three of them have been raising this issue. I can't even, I can't even look at them without thinking about that. So, um, uh, but I do believe the infusion of dollars, the first place Congress went on COVID-19 was putting substantial dollars, resources, and flexibility in telemedicine. And I think um, to Gail's point, when people see that and see its potential capabilities in well-served areas, we may see that as something we can really build on and justify some significant investment in the broadband area. But, um, but I'll, I'm gonna turn it back to Congressman Taki. I was simply going to say that I think what, uh, what Tom Daschle said was, is really accurate in terms of the uh, questions relating to lifestyle and availability of good schools and all of these other uh, potential issues that one has in rural areas. But I think another big factor is this, that whether in rural areas or urban areas, uh, physicians and uh, very few physicians practice alone. Uh, why is it that in a, an urban area that the single practitioner has gone away? Well, in part, it's because of the paperwork, the regulatory challenges. I alluded to this earlier, but the, our system is so complex. Uh, we can't understand our own insurance, most of us, uh, or why we get something gets reimbursed or doesn't get reimbursed or the amount it gets reimbursed. Well, if you are a uh, single practitioner in a rural area and you have to try to work through all of that for Medicare, for Medicaid, for various insurance programs, the paperwork and the bureaucracy you're dealing with is uh, overwhelming. And most physicians don't have to deal with that because they have back office staffs that take care of that thing, that sort of thing. And I think that uh, one of the challenges, in addition to the lifestyle issues, and people make different choices about that, but one of the challenges is how do you allow, how do you get uh, people who are practicing medicine in rural areas, how do you make it possible for them to spend their time actually engaged in, the, in working with patients rather than having to deal with all of the, uh, all of the paperwork and the uh, other difficulties involved in having a practice? Marilyn, related to this, I, I might just uh, just a footnote. Um, I understand we've had some questions about why or why we haven't really focused as much on frontier communities, but uh, I think it should be emphasized that we have. Uh, this is really building on what we did in our earlier report a couple of years ago, and um, and I think it's the combination of these two reports together that give us sort of the comprehensive view of our uh, of our. Uh, concern for rural health and, and our proposals to address it. But it's that combination of the first and the second report together, I think we need to look at, as, especially as we address frontier communities. Senator, this is Bill Hoagland. I, I'm glad you raised that because I did want to make sure that people realize that this built upon a previous report that we put together. It was a staff report, not a task force, but it did include, we did have staff visits in South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, particularly frontier health was a critical issue, not just rural health. Thank you, Senator, for raising that. And the we one that post that report as well. We should post that as well. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and do that. Um, the one thing I will mention is that this is this is one of the reasons why the task force uh, decided to offer as many different pathways and payment options as possible so that states could be flexible. The one thing we heard over and over again as we as we visited <laughs> rural areas was if you have seen one rural area, you have seen one rural area. And certainly uh, every area that we visited uh, was very different, had different needs, had a different infrastructure, had a different uh, uh, workforce challenges. Well, many of the same challenges, but there were differences. And, uh, and this is certainly, we, we uh, of course feel like we've got a lot more work to do uh, uh, in, in addressing rural healthcare challenges. But this was one of the reasons why we, 
we and the task force felt that it was necessary to offer many options and be as flexible as possible. Hey, Marilyn, I just want to say one last thing about workforce and particularly primary care offices um, that are um, frequently not getting the same amount of attention that the hospitals are. Um, they're, when people talk about hospital relief, and, the, and they did in that the previous COVID, not the one that's being passed today, it also included some significant dollars for um, primary care physicians, physicians across the board, actually, as a matter of fact. And this is really critical right now because we're seeing a moment in time where people simply are not going to their physicians um, and they can't keep their offices open. And if you're one of those offices that was thinking about retiring early and to set up a whole process again and rehire people, et cetera, it's, it's a, it, I'm, I'm really afraid if those dollars do not continue during this stopgap period, we could see a number of these offices closing at, at a moment when we really need them. So um, as much as we talk about hospitals, we, we do need to talk about physicians' offices in this moment to give them the stopgap protections. Okay, so one of our questioners asks uh, about the role of um, uh, nurses, primary care physicians, home health workers, IT experts. Should we be paying education expenses for people who enter these shortage areas? Um, I'm, I'm a big supporter for using loan forgiveness uh, for attracting people uh, who uh, you need and are not able to uh, attract. Uh, and uh, I think this is one that is increasingly attractive uh, as the cost of training uh, goes up uh, and that this would be um, something that we could make more extensive use. I actually think that uh, even for physicians, uh, we can do that. Um, uh, because uh, the, although uh, historically uh, this hasn't worked as well, the uh, cost of uh, medical school and the length of training uh, has increased significantly uh, that we may not want to uh, dismiss that. But especially for all of the other health workers, uh, which are also in short supply, uh, I think it is, uh, is something that is, uh, is worth trying. I would agree. I mean, I think that that is, uh, I think those are critical incentives that we have to continue to explore and to implement. And some have been used very well in the past. And uh, we have to make sure that we can work on these kinds of initiatives for the future to create incentives for, to draw various and ranges of uh, providers in rural communities. One of the areas uh, when it comes to workforce that we've heard a lot about is uh, access to mental health services and behavioral health services. Uh, in fact, we um, conducted a poll um, through Morning Consult in partnership with the American Heart Association at the beginning of this project. And what people in rural areas told us was very high on their list of concerns about access to services, <clears throat> was their ability to access mental health or behavioral health care services. So why is it a bigger challenge in rural areas to get these services? And uh, is it, and then as an extension to that, is it possible that some of this tel new telehealth uh, ability is going to, to help in this area, even beyond COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, this is an area that the military uh, has been very actively uh, using, uh, particularly with mental uh, health uh, services. Um, so I, I think it may be uh, something that is, it's not obvious, or at least it wasn't obvious to me, uh, that mental health services uh, would be amenable uh, to telehealth. 
uh, but the military has reported uh, quite successful use in this. In one of the reasons that there is a particular shortage in this area is that there is a shortage generally uh, in terms of mental health services. And so uh, basically the rural areas are competing uh, with the urban areas uh, for a specialty that's in short supply. Uh, this is another place where uh, at least one of the challenges uh, reportedly has been a lower reimbursement given uh, the amount of time that is uh, typically uh, required to provide uh, the services. Uh, it may well be an area where there are um, uh, support uh, health workers uh, that uh, are not being used uh, as imaginatively uh, as they could. And this is again something uh, where uh, the VA and uh, the military uh, may have some models uh, to share uh, that would be useful in, in providing uh, health care. But in particular, uh, they've been, the military has been very successful uh, in using mental health uh, produced via telehealth. I think it's fair to say that uh, there are very few uh, uh, mental health professionals in most rural areas. Uh, if there are shortages of uh, other kinds of uh, healthcare specialists in rural areas, it certainly is a bigger shortage in the, in the mental health area. So that means traveling long distances. Therefore, telehealth is uh, particularly important. The Des Moines Register article I alluded to earlier highlighted the uh, significant growth in the men mental health services via uh, broadband uh, connections. Uh, counts, and not just uh, mental health services as we often think of them, but also th things like family counseling, uh, where or we're sheltering in place now and uh, uh, we find some of the uh, uh, stresses and strains of uh, family life can uh, be exacerbated during this time, uh, a period like this. And uh, having access to those, uh, to counseling services uh, via telehealth makes a whole lot of sense and it uh, also gives uh, real, real uh, help to uh, a lot of people. So I think that uh, one of the things, again, that this highlights is, is that um, the communication services that can be available in rural areas can deliver a lot of, uh, of terrific uh, benefits, and that would include in the mental health area. Yes, Marilyn, Marilyn, I think we are getting down to the last uh, five minutes here, maybe the best thing to do is to let everybody um, make any final comments and then I will close it out here since we are just about out of time. Absolutely, would love to have your final comments, uh, panelists, if there's something in particular that you would love to see happen, uh, either in the short term uh, during this COVID crisis as it relates to rural or in the longer term, what is most important to you here or what would you like to say as we, uh, as we wrap up? I, I would just wanna thank the entire staff at the DPC and, and, our, and our sponsors once again. This has really been an important project and I couldn't think of a more timely effort than what we've, uh, what we've now witnessed as a result of the COVID crisis. And so I appreciate very much all of the work that's gone into this, each of my colleagues on the task force and the commitment and time and effort that they've made. But, uh, but to thanks to each of you and especially to our great staff. Thank you, thank you, you all you very know. much. Yeah, I just would express my you know, gratitude to all of you and to everyone involved in, in this process and invite our viewers as well to provide feedback uh, on this report. This isn't all inclusive. Uh, you know, this is the beginning of a, of a significant initiative that we hope uh, that will draw, you know, uh, the attention and the consideration, um, you know, in Congress, you know, as they move forward on some of these issues. And we appreciate uh, the legislative support uh, from uh, Senator Grassley as chair of the Senate Finance Committee uh, and all those who will be contributing to this, uh, to this effort. Uh, but we use this as a catalyst for prompting the significant change that is you know, certainly warranted at this time uh, and most especially because of this time. 
I serve on the uh, board of the Bipartisan Policy Center Action Network. Uh, that is the group, uh, the arm of the organization that uh, advocates uh, for policy recommendations on Capitol Hill. And uh, so I think as uh, our work as a task force uh, wraps up and uh, results in this report, now the uh, Action Network needs to get to work and uh, push these uh, policy suggestions uh, uh, with our friends and uh, on Capitol Hill. And it's tough. It's a tough time to uh, push these things. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, with crisis comes opportunity. And I think that uh, this crisis has shown the tremendous need for and the benefits of things like telehealth and other things that can uh, improve the delivery of services in rural America. So I'm optimistic. I think we need to find a way to make sure that the flexibility in the use of telehealth uh, is continued to be reimbursed uh, by Medicare uh, and especially by the private payers. Medicare and Medicaid, I think, have uh, enough uh, pressures that they may be more amenable. Uh, it's gonna be important to make sure that the private payers uh, follow suit. And I'll just conclude by saying that it really has been a great privilege to work with my task force members and the staff um, to produce this report. Uh, I agree with Congressman Taki that this moment is an opportunity uh, to really build on the focused attention that we are seeing on both the limitations of our healthcare systems and the opportunity to, to overcome barriers to access it in a much more efficient, effective way. And there is a big appetite, uh, both now and into the future. You can just feel it. Uh, people all around Washington are focused on how do we use COVID-19 experiences to uh, improve our healthcare delivery system. And uh, I know know that uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center will be very much involved in that process, not just focusing on rural issues, but a, a whole array of other issues. And I'm, I'm very excited that this group uh, on this screen will be a big part of that. And I should, I should just take that uh, opportunity to let folks know that, that we are uh, launching a behavioral health integration task force where uh, the group will be working uh, together to uh, break down barriers to integrating uh, mental health and behavioral health services with primary care uh, physical health services. Thank you. And stay tuned Thank for that. Bill? Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Senator Daschle, Senator Snow, Congressman Taki, Gail, Chris. Chris, by the way, it's not just in Washington. It's also in the states are looking at how this can better improve upon their health care delivery. And I think this is a federal state relationship that we're gonna to have to work with. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining all the, the number of people have remained on the whole two hours or so of this. That's really great. Uh, I want to uh, apologize, as I said at the outset, this is a little bit of a new experience for us dealing with this kind of new technology. And I wanna to apologize to Congressman uh, Small for the glitch we had earlier in the session uh, with her video. Uh, in closing, uh, like uh, Senator Daschle, we want to particularly give a shout out to the BPC staff of Maryland uh, and uh, all the work that uh, the staff have put into this, Morgan Bailey, Dina McDonald, Tyler Barton, Catherine Hayes, Joanne Donaldson, and our chief medical advisor, Anand Park. Uh, we all hope at BPC, as uh, Congressman Taki said, that we will take this through our 501c4 uh, advocacy work and, and continue to advocate on a number of these recommendations that we put forward. And we hope that they uh, either considered in the current package or there will be more packages, I am sure, as we go forward for the rest of this year. And finally, just as a, uh, another shout out, to, we have another uh, video uh, webinar tomorrow from 2 to 3.30 where at BPC you can go to the website and get a link to it where we're going to be talking about the interaction between our artificial intelligence and how it can be used in uh, the current pandemic. So again, thank you all. Thank you all viewers for staying in. Uh, stay in touch and uh, good day and stay safe. Thank you very much.